Hello, beautiful community. You're very welcome to this uh, chat. That's really going to be a follow up to the main channel video where in a series of sort of multi layered and indirect approaches, I raised the issue of imperialism among oppositional Russians, among anti-war Russians, among Russians who are planning for a post Putin future that is continuous with a modern democratic republic. And the questions and themes that have come out that we're going to look at today very briefly, I hope, um, is first, can you eradicate prejudice altogether? Two, um, how significant is the example that you picked, the bigness of, as virtue um, example, which is an example of a Russian cultural myth that can feed into imperialism? Um, what are your thoughts about the video and the algorithm? The video is a kind of a, a kimikaze thing to do in the algorithm. Um, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, can you make more of a connection between your critique and actual opposition figures? I was reluctant to do this in the video, but I'll do it a bit now. Um, is all imperialism bad and could Russia have kept Ukraine in its orbit by a soft power? And can you say more um, about the kind of anti-imperialism Ukraine should ask for from the Russians? Mm. So, a couple of thoughts on the video first. Um, w one thing that was distinctive about it is that it was a um, deep critique of imperialism. By deep critique, I mean the tip of the iceberg of a critique um, that nevertheless um, didn't draw at all on the current state of post-colonial discourse in the West. In other words, it simply did not draw on at all on the kind of hyper-identity politics that is prominent in Western public discourse today and in fact places certain conception of progress first um, and places truth second. And I believe that the trouble is, and we'll find this out painful in reality, is that when you place progressive enterprises on top of shoddy constructions that are just part of um, fashionable kinds of nonsense that come and go, the nonsense will collapse and will damage the construction you've elaborated on top of it. So actually, real progress is always about your idea of progress being derived from um, putting truth first and a, a properly truthful relation to the social world, to the culture and so on. So um, you can actually have deep critiques of imperialism that do not descend into the kind of stuff that we're seeing all over the place and will ourselves be engaging with and critiquing uh, constructively in the months to come. I mean, the second thing about the video is it was just a sort of a, a, a semblance of a gesture in the direction of how one deals with prejudice and how prejudice occurs, recurs, persists, and how it can be dissolved. Um, then another aspect of the video, clearly, yes, is that it was a critique of the Russian opposition without naming any of them. Um, and it was also a critique of some Ukrainian anti-colonial discourse. And it was also a statement about um, social forces in our societies today. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg that I gave there, which are um, pulling the ground from underneath the kind of um, the kind of minimal social integration that may or may not be necessary to sustain not just democratic values but democratic institutions. So this is very very serious stuff, and of course to do all of this indirectly is um, asking for for disaster on YouTube. But I 
I, I think that um, I, I hate the video as um, a YouTube product, but I like it as a, as a cultural intervention. And that's why the video may need to change clothes as, as it goes on. So question one, can you eradicate prejudice? Um, so th the answer to that is no. Um, Miranda Fricker, who I mentioned um, in the video, and she's a philosopher of the younger generation, we can still say that about somebody in their early 50s because philosophers come into their own in their 60s and 70s. Um, but she likes to say that prejudice is always in the air, and that's right. And so the very idea of a gotcha approach to prejudice is really a misunderstanding on more than one level. Um, the, the, the best way to think about prejudice is that what one's trying to do is improve the air quality. And the air quality cannot be perfect because we're human. But we're trying to improve the air quality and you're not going to ask from your HEPA filter that it makes the air perfect. You're going to ask from it that it reduces the, uh, you know, uh, things you don't want in the air below below a certain level. And that's why it doesn't make much sense to go around and saying, "Oh, got you, you're an imperialist," or "Got you, you're a um, you're a racist," except in certain very clear and grave cases. Um, but just at the border, as it were, when you're saying, oh, there's a bit of something going on there that's this and that, gotcha, that doesn't make any sense because then you, the people you're going to get is going to be everybody. Um, so um, you, you ca absolutely cannot start with the idea that um, it's about drawing a line between those who are on the right side of this and those who are on the wrong side of this and then producing a Twitter tribunal to tell everybody who is on which side. That's just not a good approach. Um, whether you're talking about racism, whether you're talking about imperialism, whether you're talking about any other kind of prejudice. Um, but I mean, come on, that, that's not enough. Surely there's got to be some way of you know, constructively distinguishing between the, the things that really matter and the things that don't. So can you give us something? Well, here is one really important distinction that's really helpful. Um, it, it, it's really important to bear in mind that there's a difference between a personal reckoning with the prejudice and a political reckoning with the prejudice, right? And just conceptually, you have to realize that this is the case. So imagine that um, you are looking at racism, right? A project to make progress with racism could conceivably, let's imagine it's a well-intentioned project, it could conceivably have the following possible outcomes. It could uh, be constructive um, in terms of both a private reckoning with racism and a, and a political reckoning with racism. It could be constructive with neither, it could be counterproductive. Um, or it could be constructive in terms of a personal reckoning with racism, but unconstructive in terms of a political reckoning with racism. Right? So a personal reckoning with racism is um, the sort of thing we were talking about in the video, right? Um, you know, what kind of, um, even if my beliefs are intact about these things, what kinds of images are there in my head that I could make more transparent to myself and explore a little bit more and see how they um, impact the way I read the world and possibly the way I distort the world and possibly the way I distort people's experience. Now, a political reckoning with racism is different. It's have we made our institutions better at dealing with this or not, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very practical question. It's a question that is to do with not our direct relationships, how you and I meeting in the coffee shop, but our relationships mediated by the institutions that we share. 
So that's a very, very important difference. So, for example, um, we might say about a certain Russian that they're quite certainly not an imperialist for all political purposes. Um, but, of course, that doesn't mean that we're not going to find some imperialist um, imagery in their mind. Um, and it may or may not be useful to challenge it. If it's below a certain level, if it's quite minimal, it could be reduced to the level of, um, you know, irony and, and even humor and so on. So, you know, I I if we've got a, let's say, a Russian oppositional politician who says, well, you know, all Ukrainian territory from 91 is Ukrainian, um, we're going to pay reparations, this is an imperialistic war, and with you know Russia in many of its incarnations did this stuff before many times, blah blah blah. So we we can say that for for political purposes that person is not an imperialist. They're just not. But I mean, but 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 little little things still. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, right. I mean, you know, it, imagine uh, this example that we we didn't take in the video, but it's not unrelated to the. A prejudice example, um, the, the virtue as, as bigness um, myth and potential consequent imperialistic prejudice um, example that we did in the video. Imagine that somebody sa just feels that, of course, they know that Ukrainian is just as valid a language as other languages, but because it's sort of got this history of being a language on the periphery, and because there is this sort of history of Russians disparaging. The Ukrainian language, as though it was some kind of baby Russian, um, there could be some residue of lower, lower credibility still there that would need to be explored, even by that Russian who is, for political purposes, anti-imperialist. You know, they could catch themselves, let's say, at a conference, listening to a talk in Ukrainian about something, and just. Um, not quite giving that talk as much credibility as they'd give it if it were in German or in French, you know? Um, so this distinction between the private and the public reckoning with uh, racism is very, very, with imperialism, with any prejudice really, is uh, very, very important. That, that's all I'm going to say on this for now. Um, how significant is the example that you picked? Um, um, bigness as virtue. Um, it's not. It's not. So I deliberately picked um, one of many different examples I could have picked because what I was after is not um, a particular cultural myth leading to prejudice. I was after the, 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 the workings of the machinery, as it were. Right? And the example didn't matter. That's why I in particular picked uh, an example that is not going to be at the very top, right? Because you know, the the imperial um, prejudices in Russia aren't caused by thinking that that country's got to be big in the first instance. That's not the cause of it. But it, but it's interesting that something like that, even something like that, absolutely plays a role. You know, so that's why I picked um, a small example. But there are, there are. Uh, there's a plethora of reasons why, for instance, Russians sometimes struggle to to properly latch on to the imperialistic credentials of the Soviet Union. And some of these reasons are to do with other cultural myths. But some of these reasons are kind of to do with banalities. Um, so, um, a lot of the um, capitals um, under the Soviet system, the capitals of these independent countries, and now independent countries, um, flourished compa compared with um, rural Russia, or compared with um, uh, medium towns in Russia. You know, so the capital of Ukraine, the capital of Kazakhstan, were exotic places where things were better than in most of Russia. And so, uh, to, to a lot of Soviet Russians, 
And you might say the same about Latvia, Estonia, you know. I mean, I, I, I spent summers in the childhood in Latvia and, 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 and the border of Latvia and Estonia. And this was an exotic place. The West was idealized at the time. And being in the Baltics felt like being a quarter of the way to Belgium. Um, it felt much more sophisticated and refined and advanced than um, than Moscow, even. Um, so uh, you know, we shouldn't assume some kind of a sim simplistic idea there of you know center and periphery, the way we see how all of this hung together. But the point is that. Um, some of these people that were part of the Soviet Union weren't comparing themselves to Russia. They were comparing themselves to what if they hadn't been captured by the Warsaw Pact, if they hadn't be, been captured by, by the Soviet Union or by the Soviet sphere of influence. And so a lot of Russians would have thought, well, my God, you know, um, Poland, it just feels so exotic and extraordinary. I mean, East Germany just feels just like the moon if you're in the Soviet Union. Um, but the problem is, these people would say, no, no, yes, it, it's better here than in Russia, possibly, possibly, but it, 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 that's not where we want to be. We don't want to be in this damn umbrella you've put us under. Um, anyway, so... The, the, the point I wanted to convey in the video was about the, the, the structure of the distortions, the structure of the prejudice, rather than saying that this idea is important of itself. Actually, I cut out a bit of the video where I explained that my example is relatively minor. Um, a few words about the video and the algorithm. Um, so, I messed up. Um, it's a very sort of indirect and multi-layered video. And I thought that um, just um, a clear, pr pr provocative, candified YouTube rapper w would give um, the video the possibility to be seen by some more people. And, and that didn't work at all. Um, the video uh, uh, wasn't popular among regular watchers of the main channel. Um, and if it's not, it just doesn't travel anywhere. Um, so I'm happy with it as a as a, a kind of intervention, but obviously it's poor as a YouTube product. Um, there's a a difference between, in my opinion, between being an intellectual, and being a public intellectual. As an intellectual, you want to make something available. Right, whether the, the culture then access that thing or not, that's what really matters. It matters that a book is out there, not that people have engaged with it. Um, and certainly in professional philosophy, the best philosophers would often say, well, I'm only interested in seven people reading my stuff. Um, and they're the people who can follow what I'm doing. Um, and that's because particularly in certain areas of philosophy, what one's writing is so difficult that most of your professional colleagues aren't going to be able to understand it. And that's not because it's obscure. If it's obscure, it's bad. Obscurity is, is an evil. Um, and so you can say that I've made this available. And then, you, you know, yes, if it's more than seven people who access it, that's fantastic. But the more the merrier. But seven is more than enough. What matters is the availability, right? Um, just the same way, um, the, the culture that still has an open um, concert hall with performances there is the culture that's got a rich classical music tradition. Um, it's good, but not essential that the halls are then filled. Right? And, and the, the cause and effect there is actually also often misunderstood. It's the performers that create the audience. It's the audience audiences do not make performers. Um, performers perform the music they're most passionate about until there is an audience for it. Um, and if there isn't a big audience for it, there's going to be a small audience of, of, and of that like, they, they will live. And if they don't have enough of, a, of an audience, but they're doing important stuff, they should be supported to do that. So 
basically, if you're an intellectual, it's about availability. But if you're a public intellectual as well as an intellectual, um, it, it's not availability, it's, it's engagement. It's engagement. And so um, in that sense, the, the audience is never wrong. It can never be wrong. They can be wrong about opinions they hold. But if there's a lack of an impact on an audience, it's always your fault. It's never the fault of the audience. That's very, very important to, to understand. And I think a lot of uh, uh, intellectuals who, who transition into being public intellectuals don't fully get that. And that's really important to get. But then there's another complicating thing that if you're a public intellectual and you're operating via an algorithm, um, then you have to not just start with um, you know, the final verdict being the impact on, on the audience, but also w w with um, acceptance of the fact that the algorithm is there and you have to accept its reality. And you know, the algorithm um, is both transparent to what people really want, but also isn't. Um, in other words, it, it takes our lower instincts and magnifies them. So in that sense, it's transparent to them. But it's, um, to a good extent, antithetical to a refinement of instincts about what one wants to consume. doesn't mean you can't refine your instinct, but it just means the algorithm is going to work against that, typically. And what it's going to work for is a consumerist relation with content you um, absorb. And, and understand this really well. That does not mean that you're going to absorb low quality stuff. Uh, it rather means that uh, it's consumerist in the sense that you say, this is what I want to buy. I'm going to go out there and buy it. Right. And I'm going to buy it the best quality of it. So a consumerist relation doesn't mean you're going to go out there and buy yourself a bad cup of coffee. No, you could actually go out there and buy yourself a, a beautiful cup of coffee with wonderful texture and transparency and whatever you're into. Um, but it's still going to be you knowing what you want and you going out to get it. So what is that not conducive to? It's not conducive to a relation whereby the audience is um, uh, engaging in an exploration of what they want. It's not conducive to that. And we're trying to break it on, the, on these channels. We're trying to go against that current to some extent. Um, and we're succeeding as well, little by little. So Th th that's what you that's what you have to that's what you have to reckon with and I think what happened on this occasion um, is that even though I'm gaining experience with this format this app um, I thought that that sort of multifaceted and direct thing that I was sharing could, could be encouraged to travel through more um, than actually was um, than actually was possible. So it's interesting. Um, and, you know, this obviously leads to something we're not going to talk about on this occasion. And that's what I call audience capture and algorithmic drift. And, and just how powerful that, how powerful that is, and how it's almost impossible to understand the, po the, the pull of it until you're on this end, right? And, and, and then it, it, it's startlingly revealing how people with seemingly good integrity but not the greatest stability um, make themselves vulnerable to audience capture and algorithmic drift such that uh, over the course of a year or two they traverse such a distance that they become unrecognizable from what they used to be before. Um, can you make more of a connection between your critique and actual opposition figures? I mean that's another thing I could have got the, the video um, off the ground if it was a kind of a an evisceration of particular position figures. Um, look, there is a crisis of depoliticization among the Russian opposition. And that's why I recently paid some attention to a couple of things Dugin has done, because embarrassingly, Dugin 
is making small inroads into politicizing the post-Putin um, phase in a way that I think the Russian opposition could do better with. Um, and so what, what they need to do is to um, politicize the post-Putin space as something that is both real and inevitable, as something that is going to present choices, and as something that's going to present choices about which we could think and toward which we could also begin acting now. And then they could also explore ways of reaching more of the population, particularly that depoliticized blob in the middle that ain't going to move, no matter how bad things get, unless there is a per the perception of actionable alternatives. So that's very, very important. And um, it, it's important to be both critical of the Russian opposition, but also to be aspirational that they need to do better, because in the end, we have to politicize that space. It's in all of our interest to politicize that space. It's no good fantasizing about the big blue sea in Russia's place. It's just not going to happen. Um, even if Russia were to fragment, we'd still need to talk about how to politicize that space. We're still going to have to deal with whatever is happening on that space. That's really, really important. You've got a very big gamut. Um, you've got people who are trying to operate in a consensual, in a consensual, in a, in a cooperative way, um, and yeah, are 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 going for a certain kind of consensus, pluralistic consensus across differences. You've then got people who are trying to leverage themselves by quarreling with everybody else. You've got various different types of outlier positions. So, for example, there is at least one voice who is sort of sp sp speaking up for a supposed set of partisan movements inside Russia, which unfortunately aren't real. Um, you've got quite a bit of debate about what happens after Putin and what a democratic Russia looks like, which is, which is healthy. But you don't have much serious discourse about the post-Putin transition. You just don't. And there's a real crisis of politicizing that upcoming phase. And what happens instead is often a set of ethical pronouncements and ethical proclamations which are no good, because you need politics, not ethics. Um, ethics is an important consideration in politics, but ethics without politics is ethics. It's not politics at all. Um, and these stories are very complex, you know, um, these transi trans transitions out of authoritarian uh, regimes, if one's going to happen in Russia. Um, you know, often you end up sitting at the same table as the person who in the past imprisoned you and working in a coalition with them. Um, so who can you begin to peel off from the Putin regime? How could you do that? Um, you know, these are really important practical questions for now, as opposed to, if anything, b broadening this barrier beyond which you're, you're saying everything is beyond the pale, you're not going to engage with it. Well, if that's what you're going to do, you're going to leave unengaged then the Russian political scene. And you could end up just speaking to a Western audience, right? And that's absolutely not, not, not true of all Russian oppositional figures, but it's true of, of some. I mean, let me give you some, let me give you a catastrophic example from this week. Um, and I am not so emotional about it because I'm a, I'm emotional about my political representatives. 
I'm emotional about Britain. Um, I'm emotional about the West. Um, the Russian opposition does not represent me, so I don't get as emotional, but I can see how emotional I would get if I saw what again happened this week. Um, on Mr. Navalny's Twitter, there was a multi-tweet thread with pictures and evidence that Mr. Khodorkovsky had hired somebody to work for, for him and his organization that had a very unlovely pro-regime past. And definitely said some really terrible things about the Russian opposition and even about Navalny when he was working for a head of a region in Russia a few years ago. Then he jumped ship and then he's supposed to have done something else bad that we don't know what the evidence for that is. Um, and then Mr. Khodorkovsky employed him and Mr. Navalny's Twitter said that Mr. Navalny is ashamed um, you know, to, to, to stand with Mr. Khodorkovsky in opposition to the Putin regime because of this. Um, I mean, let's, let's assume the worst case scenario about that person, right? Whoever that person is. Um, but one way or another, it's, a, it's, it's not even a 10th order issue, it's a 77th order issue. There's a, an organization doing good work, maybe they could do more effective work. Mr. Khodorkovsky is running and somebody is hired there with such a bad past that they shouldn't have been hired. Ukrainians are dying. R Russia is increasing its risks of um, revolution, civil war, dependence on China, fragmentation. The Russian regime is saying they're going to kill everybody. The war isn't stopping. Mr. Putin still solidly in power. But the the issue to talk about is that Mr. Khodorkovsky hired somebody. Right. Now, it's it's important to to not be loose with language, but Sometimes loose language is appropriate too. So is this sick? Yes, it's sick. Is this toxic? Yes, it's toxic. It's toxic and sick. Um, even if the, the particular characterization of the, the person at hand is true. Um, Mr. Navalny is being slowly killed in jail. The last statements on Mr. Navalny's Twitter are or at least he's being significantly physically depleted that makes his life, puts his life at serious risk. He is Mr. Putin's number one enemy inside the country. Um, you know, he's been infected with bugs deliberately. He has been tortured. He has been struck. So an ambulance attend to him a few, you know, a few days ago. And the issue is this kind of, higher that an ally has done and Mr. Khodorkovsky was forced to come out and say you know you might be ashamed of me Mr. Navalny but I stand with you and hold your hand through this this is Mr. Khodorkovsky is a, also a long time prisoner political prisoner in Russia so um Mr. Navalny, it also says on Mr. Navalny's Twitter that Crimea is Ukrainian, that um, uh, Saakashvili should stop being tortured, um, and not that much else. Um, and so next to issues of that seriousness, there is that, there is this. So. And, and he gets 30 minutes a day to have a pencil in, in the cell. So 
Um, it's even hard to believe that Mr. Navalny is really involved with that thread. I wouldn't even be surprised if he didn't know the whole the, the whole story here. I mean, how extraordinary to play games like that um, in the middle of everything that's going on. So that's that's prime depoliticization, prime depoliticization. But you know, if a Russian came to me and said, well, I'm exasperated by this, I never want to have anything to do with this group, I'm going to support other oppositional groups, I would still say, no, get in there with these Navalny folks and just hope and help them become better and come out of this. Um, uh, ridiculous phase because uh, you don't have a choice um, but if, if for reasons of sort of just effective and uh, expressive and not effective politics that Russian person just said I can't deal with this I don't want to have anything to do with them I, I, I disagree with them because you've got to be practical but I understand I don't understand them um, is all imperialism bad could Russia have kept Ukraine in so well I certainly don't think um, you can get rid of imperialism in the world. Um, that's not a coherent enterprise. Major powers are going to be what they are. Um, and I certainly categorize the United States as more an empire than not. And I regard um, the United States intervention in Ukraine as an imperial intervention, and I regard it as a positive imperial intervention. So there are certain conceptions, if not of benign empires, and certainly of um, benign actions by partly benign empires. Um, so that's a separate conversation. I think some people could could argue that the United States is most helpfully not thought of as an empire. Be suspicious of their American. <laughs> and, um, but that that conversation doesn't really matter. Um, w w what it what it probably settles is that it it's at least not obvious that all imperialism is that all you know, empires are bad um, and all imperial behavior is bad because some global problems might just be insoluble without imperial um, uh, backup. Um, now, but that's not the question. The question is, could Russia have kept Ukraine in a sphere of um, influence through soft power? And the answer is, well, of course, the outcome would have been radically different. We just don't know what exactly it would have been. But of course, the outcome would have been radically different if from 1991 on, Russia went on into a democratic path, right? And came at Ukraine only with soft power. We're going to invest in Ukrainian infrastructure. We're going to elevate Ukrainian culture. Um, uh, we're going to create a common space. Um, well, first, the Ukrainians wouldn't have had a problem rejecting that because it wouldn't have been backed up by force. Um, but certainly it, it, it would have been a radically different situation uh, to the situation that uh, we, we have got now. And yes, uh, quite certainly, um, uh, Russia could have retained much more of um, an ideological influence on Ukraine if it wanted to via soft power. Whereas now, even if somebody made a, 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 you know, waved a magic wand, um, and Russia's army quintupled in size and could take all of Ukraine, um, Russia's chances of ideological control of Ukraine would be, except just by brute force, would be zero, right? It'd be absolutely zero. Um, so yeah, it would have been it, it, it would have been a big difference. And here, you know, in this alternative history, uh, R Russia would be taking. Um, a leaf out of the book of U.S. imperialists, but that's absolutely not what happened. What Russia's ended up offering is um, nothing plus violence, nothing plus violence. Um, and uh, as we discussed in the video, it's absolutely a mistake to think that this was just some kind of imposition um, that Putin assembled. In other words, the, 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 the the, the roots of what happened certainly were, were present in the culture, but lots of terrible roots are present in all sorts of cultures. The question is how they get actualized, whether they get actualized or not. Um, can you say more about the kind of anti-imperialism um, Ukraine should ask for from Russia? Yeah, I can. Um, basically, 
you've got to get that space politicized and you've got to support Russians who politicize the space and you've got to be skeptical of Russians who are prancing around doing moralistic Twitter tribunals on each other. Um, but it's very important, of course, also that that is the space that's being politicized. Russian opposition uh, absolutely are not there to meet Ukrainian needs. They're not. They're gonna, if, they're, if they're going to be there to meet Ukrainian needs, they're not going to politicize Russia, and you're going to still have that sort of disaster going on in Russian territory. Um, so you, 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 if you're Ukraine, you understandably have feelings of the big blue ocean being there instead of Russia. It's understandable. It's bloody understandable, for goodness sake. But at the same time, you want change in Russia, and you want to back up. You've got to back whatever is going to most likely generate change in Russia. Um, so the, the, the tendency to put Russians through a purity test is um, to put Russian opposition through a purity test is uh, potentially counterproductive if that Russian is actually constructive to Ukraine's ends. I mean, let's take Mr. Navalny, right? Mr. Navalny has come out and said that Crimea is um, unqualifiedly Ukrainian. Um, Mr. Navalny has said that in 2014, immediately, he said that the annexation was illegal and unacceptable and called for sanctions. Um, but did Mr. Navalny also say some um, other things? Yes, he did. Um, did Mr. Navalny say some dodgy things about um, ethnic minorities and immigration? Yes, Mr. Navalny did say those things. Did he apologize? He mostly apologized. And so where am I going with this? Nobody's asking anybody to like Mr. Navalny. One is asking people to make a judgment about whether Navalny is closer to helping their project or closer to hindering their project. Right? So forget about liking or not liking these people. They're not, they're not being voted for in a democracy. Um, and even if they were, it, it, you know, it, it would be on the Russian space. So the point is, which Russian oppositional projects right, fit Ukraine's project of wanting long-term security, wanting no damn invasions in the future and so on. And obviously that means that a any kind of um, oppositional Russian activity that increases even just by 1%, the odds of um, the overturning of the imperialistic authoritarian model of, on the Russian space, anything that increases the chances of that f favors Ukraine's national interests and therefore um, all things being equal, it's important to support that. And then if we turn to anti-imperialism inside, I think it's about being able to keep two things in mind as one engages with questions about derussification, with questions about de-Sovietization, right? Because um, going back right to the beginning, we, 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 we sort of advocated against saying, oh, that's an imperialist and therefore we're not going to talk to them. Um, it, 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 it's important to be nuanced and it's important to be um, capable of keeping contradictions in one's mind. right? Because if one wanted to, to get rid of everything that is connected with the Soviet Union and everything that is connected with the Russian language. Uh, you're going to end up cancelling a lot of Ukrainian history. You, you're going to just take away far too much Ukrainian history. You're going to have very little left from the 20th century, certainly. You have also sort of bizarre aberrations that there were Ukrainians which played a role in the ideological development of Russian imperialist ideas and so on. So, um, it's important that one's thinking about de-Sovietization, de, de is not driven by the idea of instrumentalizing your own history for the purposes of um, today's political agenda. So um, that'll be enough for today. Um, very few people would have survived this. Uh, my health has not been great through this chat, so I, I know that I meandered and struggled with words quite a lot. Um, I debated doing this from bed. 
Um, so I'm extraordinarily grateful for anybody who's, who's kept up with me. Lots of love for now. Talk soon.